Hey guys, I'm back and we have a lot to do today and a lot of ground to cover so I'm just gonna get right into it. If you guys watched my last video which was 10 new plants, um, I know, very very creative um, title for that. I showed you guys some of the new plants that I brought home. This one is getting thirstier by the day and I also showed you how infested they are from the greenhouse. So I am treating all of these as if they carry some flesh eating virus and I'm going to just completely undress them and get them fully naked and do like a full pest treatment. But I thought instead of doing a regular repot and chat, we could just move right into part two of the video I did a couple, was it weeks or months now? Probably months, a couple months back um, called this, wait, called this. I opened up my questions on my Instagram and basically said, tell me all of the advice that you have heard or have seen on Instagram that you feel have just been floating around or is um, considered popular or whatever. And then I just kind of talked about my thoughts on each of them. But of course, you know, these are just my opinions. Um, I am an amateur, I'm just a hobbyist. You can read the whole disclaimer or you can listen to the full disclaimer in the first video I did. And I would suggest you watch that video before watching this one because we covered a lot of stuff in the other video like drainage holes, watering, um, did we talk about light? Light? Uh, fertilizer? I can't remember. We do have still a lot more to cover in this video and I think there might be a part three. So um, what I'm going to start by doing is just taking it out of this soil because it's gross and it's yucky and honestly i'm not looking forward to touching these plants because of how infested they are with mealybugs and spider mites and who knows what else but we've got to do it i do have all of my points on my phone so i'm going to be looking at it pretty often just to let you guys know there was a certain order i was going to do this in um, i was going to open it up with fertilization but i think i'm going to start it with, with the last thing I was gonna bring up, which is repotting and quarantining since I'm doing it right now. So um, one of the things that came up was for new plants, don't repot right after getting it and do not quarantine. So I'm gonna go ahead and break that up into two separate questions. So first off, don't quarantine new plants. And that's gonna be a hard no for me because of stuff like this. Like you guys can see how inf infested it came straight from the greenhouse. And if I were to just plop this like right into here or plop that over there, these mealybugs are going to spread like wildfire. And then I'm gonna have to deal with mealybugs all over my shelf. So um, really the only reason that people quarantine after um, buying a new plant is just to isolate the pests. I haven't heard of any other reasons why you would need to quarantine a plant besides that. I will say that I definitely make exceptions sometimes, like if a plant comes from um, a friend, like if I get a plant from like Alice or Jing, uh, you know, they kind of tell me when they have things going on with pests or they'll be like, hey, this one was near like a mealybug plant, then I would go ahead and like be a little bit more careful, but if it's just like a regular trade or they just give me a plant and they don't give me any kind of heads up sometimes or like more often than not I'll just stick it right with my plants but definitely for plants like this that I got from the greenhouse that is just notorious for pests um, I am a hundred percent going to quarantine it just because I know there's going to be thrips there's going to be mealybugs aphids who knows what else I'm kind of hoping there are no corms in here because I do not need another scalp from corn. I have so many of them. So yeah, um, quarantining for me is kind of a must, just depending on the situation. Some people have the um, mentality that like pests are just out there. They have enough like systemics or products to use um, that it's not like it's not something that they would worry about, and that's totally fine. <clears throat> Sorry, it's really dusty. And that's fine. I don't think that it's really any of our place to like 
make people feel like they should be scared of something if it just doesn't bother them and if they don't have a problem with um you know the potential of pests getting into their other plants because they feel like they have a good routine i mean by all means if that works for you then that's fine with me it doesn't affect me at all but i think to just go out and be like don't quarantine your plants like if you have like a large platform and you're like oh i'm I never quarantine my plants or I don't recommend quarantining plants. I feel like that's a little bit, not dangerous, but I, I, I wouldn't agree with that and I would probably say something if I saw something like that. Luckily, I've, I've actually never seen that advice being given and if I did, I feel like I have the personality type that I would say something. I am going to transition this into Lechuza Pond, but I find that um, alocasias can be really, really notorious for throwing a fit when they transition or just after being repotted at all. So what I think I'm going to do is instead of go straight to pond, I might start with perlite um, just to keep things light and so that I can keep an eye on the roots and to allow some um, perlite roots to form. And then I think I'd feel better about moving it to... To pond so probably for all of my allocations right now I'm just going to take the time to take that extra step in terms of transitioning but I am kind of fully expecting some of these to just throw an absolute tantrum this one looks like it's gonna fall off I kind of want it to stay attached though anyway there's dust everywhere and then in terms of repotting new plants I would say it depends on the situation. So like, let's say that you get a new import from Equigenera. I obviously wouldn't leave it in a situation where it's just like in moss wrapped in plastic. That's kind of like a hard, hard no for me. Having a plant like this in nursery soil, again, you kind of run the risk of keeping the pests that are like hidden in there um, within perimeters of your collection or whatever. I think that People give the advice to not repot right when you get a plant because it'll like throw a fit and you want to give it time to adjust to your environment. And I would say to an extent I do agree with that because regardless if I get it from a friend or from a nursery, I do find that more often than not when I'm like so quick to get in there and repot, um, a lot of the times that transition is not very successful or I, I at least um, have like a lot of symptoms of shock or stress and um, I'm not sure if that has anything to do with how quick something has been moved from their current vessel or whatever into a new one but a lot of the times if you get a plant from let's say like Lowe's or something it's not like those conditions are like greenhouse conditions when they're just kept in the store but if you get it from an actual like greenhouse or like a nursery yeah it's going to have those con those conditions and then it's going to go straight from that into yours to be on the safe side i would say yeah give it a little while to repot but at the same time i don't necessarily think that it's, it's like a death sentence if you repot right away right now my sort of go to wait period before I repot anything no matter where it came from is a week um, I don't know if that's mostly because <laughs> laziness or um, just you know my time lately but I find that I'm I'm sort of allowing things to sit a little bit longer sometimes I'll even wait for it to like pop a new leaf before I repot and I know that th this soil like doesn't look great like it doesn't look very nice but they're gonna be fine in it and probably be fine for a while like that root system wasn't very large in comparison to like this pot like it's not completely like root bound like it has nowhere to go it definitely has space to go I think a lot of people think oh if you don't repot right away like it's gonna um, get too root bound in that little pot like that's usually not the case I think more so than not we're the ones that are like more anxious to get them out of there but for reasons um regarding pests i 100 percent know why people um, are quick to repot i definitely used to be 
more paranoid. I would have much rather risked a plant throwing a fit than um, have pests be brought into my house. But now that I'm a little bit more seasoned, I don't have that same kind of fear. I don't have a single corm. That's surprising. It's very, very rare that like these plants won't have at least one corm. Anyway, um, okay, no corm on that one. So now I'm going to unpot my alocasia luca one. Luke, luca one? Luca one? Okay, so we covered uh, don't repot new plants. Um, oh, fungus gnat. I'm gonna say that one is. Ew. I'm gonna say that is preference. Um, I don't think that I would like agree or disagree with any of those. I really think it's just up to you and just depending on the plant. I'm kind of hoping one of these has a mesh plug so that I could show it to you for this video. And I think this one might have it because it's feeling a little dense. I'm surprised those two alocasias didn't have one. Usually um, the greenhouses will grow it with the plugs for the alocasias, so that's a little strange. No plug. Where'd all the plugs go? Don't repot right after getting it. I would say, again, depends on the person, depends on the situation. I don't really think that even for myself, I have like a agree or disagree or agree to di agree or agree to disagree um, opinion. I think that for me personally, I always sort of um, do it by, uh, I do it on a case by case basis. I like make a decision whether I should repot it right away. And then don't quarantine. Uh, that's gonna be a hard disagree for me. So then the next one regarding repotting is do not repot in the winter. Um, I hope my um, anxious breathing isn't triggering anyone with anxiety, but struggling a little today, but I'm trying. I, I'm gonna say that's a also case by case um, or plant by plant thing because for my plants in my plant room that have controlled environments these guys are going to be pushing growth throughout the throughout the winter oh is this a mesh wait mm. okay sorry um so my plants in the plant room are just going to be pushing growth through the winter they're not even going to know the seasons have changed kind of just like spring and summer all year round for them. I can see um, little glimmers of what used to be a plug, but it has already disintegrated. Sorry, I just need it for the, the video. Let me just try and save quickly what I can in here. But for my plants out in the living room, um, they are gonna slow down in growth a lot like a lot a lot and this is something that I've observed over the last few years of having my plants especially in Canada where the temperatures drop pretty drastically in the winter and the light goes away like pretty much completely I would not repot a plant in the winter if it was a plant that's like pretty clearly gone dormant going dormant doesn't mean like going completely like like leafless or like going back to a stump it just means that like there is no new growth or new growth has slowed down by a lot in comparison to what the normal growth is during the growing months. So for a plant like that, that has slowed down a lot and is just kind of working on sustaining itself through the winter and not really focusing on focusing on new growth, I would not repot a plant like that just because that's not the plant at its, I guess, its strongest and you don't really want to interrupt it's like cycle that it has to stay alive during the winter but for my plants in my plant room that are just non-stop growing there is no season for me in terms of like repotting season it really is just for me dependent on whether the plant is showing me that it needs to be repotted and oftentimes if it's not a super super urgent matter like your plants will likely be fine for a while in the situation that it's been in. I just would not recommend 
repotting something in the winter if it's a plant that's not in a controlled environment just because a lot of the times those can sort of have like an adverse reaction to being disturbed and um, especially when you get like new soil or new substrate in it that has like a lot of fresh nutrients and whatever like sometimes that blast of it and it has nothing like there's nowhere for those nutrients to to go or it's not being utilized you can um have some some negative effects that way so oh look more mesh you don't need to come in here babe i'm working you're so cute in your little bandana you're so handsome you don't need to come in here, child. Oh my gosh. So in terms of the statement of don't repot in winter, I'm going to say agree to disagree just because I think it depends on the plant and the, the conditions that you're giving it. And this is why I've been looking for a freaking plug. Um, this one is you must remove death plugs. These death plugs are not, <laughs> they're not actually death plugs. They're just mesh plugs that literally look like this they disintegrate the roots grow out of them and they just eventually become part of the soil so a lot of people see these plugs on the plant and they think oh like the roots are going to suffocate it's going to get root rot but it grows out of the mesh like completely out of the mesh and really the mesh is only holding whatever is in there, but you've got an entire root system that is happening outside of this tiny little plug. Don't fear the mesh plug. I see a lot of people say that like, their plants have died solely because of the mesh plug, and I just have kind of a hard time believing that because most of the very big plants you'll see in the stores will have started from a plant with a mesh plug and oftentimes that plug is never even found, especially if it's a really, really mature plant. So like you'll see, this one once had a mesh plug, but it's completely um, disintegrated now, and I only have like little traces of it. So <sighs> I, was, I was hoping that I would have um, a full plug to show you. This is my last hope, the Alocasia Aslanii. I'm kind of nervous this one is going to just drop down to stumps once I get it out of here. I heard these can be a little bit more finicky. So yeah, uh, this one for me, like you must remove death plugs. That's a hard, hard, hard disagree for me. I've had many, pl I've had many plugs. <laughs> I have many plants that have lived with their mesh plugs just fine. Um, I can literally see that it's grown out of the mesh plug. It's not rotted inside of the mesh plug. And I don't find them to be an issue whatsoever. I hate alocasia roots. They're so delicate. I cannot believe there are no corms. I was so looking forward to corm hunting. I know these plants are small. Pudge. Pudge. I am working. I know these plants are small, but usually they'd have at least one corm. Like my sinuata that was like this big or smaller had like 20 million corms. I am like so sure this thing is gonna just drop dead by tomorrow. Um, repot once roots come out of the bottom. Wait, repot once roots come out of the bottom of the pot. I wish I had an example to show you. Probably do somewhere, like one of my Ethereums. It's a good one. It's a tricky one because if someone was like, oh, you should, re you should repot once roots come out of the bottom, I'd probably be like, oh yeah, it's probably time. But sometimes, especially with alocasias, you'll see that like, just like one root is poking out of the bottom and it's like a single one, like this long one right here that comes out but then the other ones are like much shorter and there's a lot of space in the vessel like look at how big this root system is compared to the pot like at this point this would not need to be upsized into like a five or six inch pot um, it can live in this four inch for a while so if you're just basing it on the fact you saw this little guy poke out of the bottom i would say you're probably 
moving your plants too soon because you really don't need to be repotting like all the time. I would say that like giving someone like a new person in the hobby the advice to repot once the roots come out of the bottom, sorry my foot's falling asleep, I would say that's a disagree for me just because it really just depends like how root bound it is, is like are like all of the roots coming out of the bottom, um, is the plant showing signs of decline, I think something you're better off doing is doing like a full like pull it out and see if it really truly is root bound because I didn't show you guys what it looked like out of this pot but like once I pulled it out you could mostly see soil and then just some roots so I would look at that and be like oh it's got long ways to go like there's no point in me disturbing it as it is so um yeah disagree for me must untangle root ball when repotting. I would say it really depends on the plant. The reason I like to unpot most of the soil, especially if it's coming from like a nursery, is because I just don't want anything that's hiding in that soil to stay in my house. Um, and then also for like larger plants, I don't want old soil, like old soil that could potentially be nutritionless or um, hydrophobic to take up so much of that new vessel. I really want mostly new soil to be in contact with those roots, but sometimes plants are so, so root bound that like it's nearly impossible to um, remove that or to untangle that root ball so if you feel like you're doing more damage than good I would say just try to at least aerate the the center of the root ball you can stick like a chopstick in there or something and then loosen the sides and the bottom so that those roots have like some like leeway to grow out of that little packed ball man I thought this was a freaking plug too is it like it looks like this is the plug right here. Do you guys see? But I'm not seeing the actual plug. Anyway, it's a good example to show you because this is essentially what a mesh plug looks like. It's like in this shape and you'll see that roots are already growing out of it and it's got, it's, it's free to like just grow, you know? It's not like it's preventing the roots from going anywhere. So. To me, the mesh plugs are non-issues. I don't even really care to look for them if I'm doing a repot, especially if I'm going like soil to soil. Like if I knew that there was a mesh plug in there, I probably wouldn't even dig it up and cause more issues. But I am moving these to Passive Hydro, so I'm trying to get as much soil off as possible. I might keep this one in soil, but I'm not 100% sure yet. Oh my gosh, Pudge is going berserk today. What is bothering you, child? <laughs> He's so weird. These roots feel like hay. They're so dry. It's alive, but dry. it just feels dry. So, what was I saying? What? Was I talking about freaking plugs again? You guys, my ADHD. Oh, um... So yeah, must untangle root ball. Uh, I wouldn't say must, but you you should try and loosen it as much as possible if you'd like to get some of that um, old soil out of there just because it's kind of just taking up space if it's no longer like serving your plant beneficially um, besides acting as like a substrate. But for me, if I'm like repotting especially a large plant that I know that is it's going to be like a hard endeavor and I'm only going to be repotting this plant every few years I want to make sure that like I'm putting enough in there that's brand new that the plant will benefit from that I don't have to worry about it for a while so let's say I have like again I use a monster as an example because I've just had so many um like let's say you've got like a 12 inch monster and it's completely root bound you could, in theory, just pluck it out and just put it in a new pot and just call it a day and pack soil around it. But my issue with that is that there's this entire 12 inch mass that has old soil in it and I would love to get new soil in there if possible so that those roots inside of there can be in contact with my, with my, like, my new soil and all of the good bacteria that I'm putting in there. 
but it's not like absolutely necessary to do a repot like in theory you truly could just plop it from here to there and then pack new soil and call it a day but I find that I'm just personally more meticulous about things like that and if I can get in there I will are these dead or what <laughs> this looks completely dead okay so those are all of the new plants. Let me touch on this one topic before you guys take an ad break and I take a little break myself because I feel like I can't breathe. Planting in pot too big for the root system will kill your plant. Okay, that's a good one. So let's see if I can bring out an example here. All right, so I've got a six inch pot here and I have and I've got this little plant here. Yes, it fits and it will likely be okay in this pot for a long time, but here's the thing. Here is how large your root system is in comparison to how much substrate will be in here. I probably have enough faith in myself to plant it in a pot this big and have it be fine. But the thing is, is like most people, like let's say if you're using a hose to water, you're just watering, right? And you're just making sure everything is getting nice and drenched. But when you have a plant like this in a pot this large, you're not gonna want to water this completely and thoroughly. Meaning you're gonna have, if you do, you're gonna have way too much water sitting in here, even with drainage holes that aren't gonna be used by this tiny little root system. So if you have a pot this big, you could drench this just fine. This isn't going to hold as much water as this one. So it's not to say that if your root to pot ratio isn't complete, like perfectly right, that's not a death sentence. You basically just need to understand how much water you should be putting in the pot compared to how much light it's getting. So just kind of try and keep the ratio of the root size um, like pretty equal to how large your pot is. So this one came from a four inch pot and it probably could still live in a four inch pot, but I would probably transfer it to a five just so I don't have to worry about it for a while, but I would not go any larger than five for a root system this large. And that's just because it's just basic science, you know, like I'm trying to make an analogy of something that like we can relate to in our life. This might not be the best analogy, but it's the best that I can do off the top of my head. So let's say you have me, I'm 4'11", 105 pounds, and then you have, um, let's say like a, who's someone that's really, really big? Let's say a really, really big guy, like a really big, like heavyweight bodybuilding dude that goes to the gym. He's like freaking seven feet tall and like, 300 pounds. I don't even guys. I don't I don't know. Okay, so let's just say that right Let's say you give us a cup of water this big to drink. I Probably would not be able to make it through this whole thing I could probably only drink about this much because my stomach's a lot smaller than his but this guy probably could Drink this whole thing. You know, I've seen guys just chug like huge buckets of water he probably has a better chance of using or drinking all of this water without any negative effects whereas if i tried to drink all this water i would feel really sick um and i just would probably collapse and die it's the same concept it's like think of this as like this is how this is what you're working with in terms of how much water is going to be able to even be uptaken into this plant and this plant itself as it is, is not ever going to need this much water like it at one time. Um, the water is going to sit there for really long. It's not going to be used by the roots because it's already gotten the water that it needs. And so it's going to sit there and it's going to sit there and it's going to sit there and your plant is or your vessel is never going to dry out. Uh, not never, but it's going to dry out very, very, very slowly. So that's how you run the risk of things like root rot, even if you have something like drainage holes. So. Another reason why I really love using um, no drainage and um, clear vessels for all my plants, I can't get over how disgusting these roots are. Like, this is so freaking crunchy. So, what was I saying? Oh my gosh. Uh, 
Um, I forgot what I was saying. Um, so anyway, yeah, just look at the plant itself that you're working with. Look at the root system you're working with and just know that like a plant this size is really never going to need a pot this large right away. So I would say in terms of that advice, I would say it's good advice and I would say I agree. Um, but at the same time, I don't think it's also a death sentence. I think if you understand your conditions, then it's it may not be an issue, but just to be on the safe side, I would say, yeah, pot, um, use a vessel that's relative to the size of the root system. So I'm just looking at these mealybugs and I am getting the heebie-jeebies. So you guys will go on an ad break. I'm going to go ahead and actually take all of these to the sink and I'm just going to like completely wash them down. I'm not going to take you guys with me because I feel like I've already sort of given you enough content on this channel showing you how I wash down plants. It's nothing gonna it's not gonna be super interesting. So um yeah gonna wash these down, let them dry, and then I will probably treat it with some Azimax and I'll kind of show you how I do that. And then we'll get them repotted. So yeah. Uh ad break and I'll be right back. The plants have been washed down with um Dr. Bronner's soap and water and I did use sort of a little brush to get in between some of these you know little folds and things especially on the scalp room because the venation sinks in quite deep um, I wanted to make sure that I like scraped off any sort of mealybugs that might be hiding in there but you know I'm not feeling a hundred percent confident that these are mealybug free um, I'm pretty sure there's some hiding inside of here, like inside of these petioles. Oh look, I can see one right there. So um, I am going to be spraying these down thoroughly so that anything that's lingering in here is just gone away. Oh look, look at that in here, in this little crack. Can you guys see? I can't see. I'm gonna wipe all this water down because I don't want it to be wet when I spray my Azimax. I want it to adhere to the leaf. So that's what I'm gonna be doing. But we will also move right along this list. So we have gone over repotting and new plants and now I'm gonna go back to where I wanted to start which is fertilizer. Don't fertilize in the winter and only fertilize in the growing season. So the reason I don't like the way this one is worded is because it's using seasons again, like growing season, winter. It really just depends on the plant. Uh, it depends the conditions you're giving it. It depends on if it's in a greenhouse, like it's, if it's, is it in a controlled environment? Is it living outside? Like where exactly is this plant? Um, what, what is the care that you're giving it at the moment? Please tell me that's freaking soil. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find... Where did I show you guys that mealybug? Oh, it's here. Sorry, I just want to make sure I got it. Anywho, yeah, the only reason that I'm going to disagree with the statement as it is is because I, I don't uh, particularly like the wording of it. Um, I think a better way to say it is that if your plant is growing, continue to fertilize it. Um, if growth has slowed down pretty significantly and it's just sort of keeping the leaves that it has, then don't fertilize. But I, I don't want people coming on this channel saying like, oh, she told me to fertilize in the winter. You have to really assess it plant by plant. Like, I'm pretty sure that all of my plants in my greenhouses, as it has done historically, are going to keep growing through the winter. It's not going to slow down at all. They're just going to keep going. So I'm going to keep on with my fertilization um, regimen. But maybe for the anthurium shelf, because it's not completely enclosed, and maybe even these ones might slow down a little bit because they're not in like greenhouse conditions. It is still more in a controlled environment given that the light here is controlled and somewhat of the temperatures, but in the winter, it's gonna drop a lot. The lights in here, um, I've removed a lot of the lights. So 
once temperatures like come down like 10 20 degrees it's going to cool down in here significantly so i wouldn't be surprised if things slow down over here but then keep continuing inside of all of my enclosed greenhouses i will have to watch the fertilizing for the ones that are kind of just maintaining the foliage that it has and sort of just staying alive through the winter and then um you know continuing to fertilize the ones that are like nope it's winter and i don't care i'm just going to keep growing so you really have to look at it uh on a plant by plant or you have to make a decision on a plant by plant basis you can't just like generalize and say oh never fertilize in the winter or only fertilize in the summer i feel like that advice being sort of mentioned everywhere so frequently comes stems from the outdoor gardening hobby because then that would make that would make sense you know like there are seasons outside and um it's not in a controlled environment so yeah, I would say like for outdoor gardening, that makes complete sense to me, although I don't know anything about outdoor gardening, but this hobby is much different. Much, much, much different. So that's um, an agree to disagree for me. Also, I, I wanted to mention though, while we're on this topic, talking about fertilizer, I think a lot of people look at fertilizer as like food. Um, I guess in a way, sure it is, but fertilizer are like, they're vitamins and they're nutrients for your plant. It's not like food where like we need to eat every day or your dog needs to eat every day or it's gonna die. If you look at it in that sense, fertilizer is not food. If you want to like draw a comparison between food and plants, um, the sun is, or lights, or the sun is more so the food for your plants. Um, photosynthesis is the food for your plants, not your your um, fertilizer. The purpose of fertilizing is to make sure that your plant has enough nutrients to sustain the growth that it already has, or sustain the leaves that it already has, and to also make sure that it has enough nutrients um to continue to grow and fertilizer doesn't mean like your plants are just going to grow faster and larger right away that has a lot to do with environmental conditions the care for it it's not like it's just like a magic potion that you put in it and then all your plants are gonna like turn into like giant beasts you know i think that if you try and separate the idea that fertilizer is food for plants, you'll sort of understand the real relationship between fertilizer and your plants and you won't look at it as like, oh here you're hungry, like have some fertilizer. And then also um, just depends like what kind of fertilizer you're using, like the strength that you're using, like it's all gonna be, it's all gonna be different for us. Continuing on the conversation of fertilizer, Another thing that I got was to use period blood as fertilizer. Listen, I'm not passing any judgment here, but I'm gonna tell you right now, there is 0% chance that you are gonna get me to touch my period blood. I don't like blood, don't care where it comes from, could come from the finger, could come from your leg, but especially if it comes out of my baginda no not touching it i'm just not i'm not trying to like you know make it seem like you should be scared of period blood no i feel like a lot of people have a very good <laughs> relationship with their period blood but i i'm not one of them i'm really not i did a little bit of reading into this and i have copied and pasted a little tidbit that I got from this website and um, I will read you what it says because I, I'm not the one to talk to about feeding your plants period blood. Okay, but we're going to look at this from a non-biased standpoint. So Deloon.co says, menstrual blood contains three electrolyte nutrients that are important to both human and plant metabolism nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, the very same combo you'll find in store-bought fertilizer. 
Period blood is living tissue which will eventually die after leaving the body. Decaying tissue is susceptible to an unpleasant funk and can potentially grow bacteria that can harm your plants. So if you are going to be using blood in your plants, you need to dump the blood as soon as possible after it leaves your body and start with small amounts. Apply as evenly as possible and mix the blood in with your potting soil a bit to help the good soil microbes do their thing. Diluting your blood with water and stirring thoroughly before adding to plant is a good way to get a nice even coat with small amounts of blood. Use only on ornamental plants, not ones you plan to eat like fruits, veggies, or potted herbs. With all that said, I am not here to cast judgment. I'm here to make an opinion. And if you want my honest, honest opinion on this, it is a hard, 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 hard no for me for multiple reasons. Like I said, I just don't like blood, especially when I'm on my period. I am grossed out by the blood that comes out of me. Um, I don't have a very, I would say, healthy relationship with my menstrual cycle. I despise my menstrual cycle and I want nothing to do with it. But um, here we are. I am here in the flesh with a uterus and I'm just, I just have to live with it. So um, it's going to be a no for me. I feel like adding period blood, if anything, like it said, can make your substrate really not pleasant. Um, especially if you're doing like passive hydro or like pawn. Sorry, I'm actually getting very grossed out. I just I really don't like blood. Fun fact, I was going to become a nurse. Um, sorry, I always laugh when I think about it because it's just funny to me, thinking of me as a nurse. Um, I took one prereq class for the nursing program. The second I saw blood, I booked it out of there. I was gone. I uh, never returned. So, yeah, bl it, blood is a no, 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 no. Blood is a no for me. I don't do blood, um, and I don't want to mix blood with my plants. I just feel like that's a recipe for disaster. But, you know, if you like it and it works for you and your, your um, substrate doesn't get stinky or nasty, hey... Like I always say, do what works for you and don't let anyone tell you what to do. But if you're coming here and you want my 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 opinion on it, it's I'm going to say just use fertilizer. I just I'm not I don't think I could ever be on board with using period blood as um fertilizer. Like there was one time where my <laughs> I had like a massive freaking zit on my face in high school, what was it, high school or like middle school or something. And this is when I was living with my grandparents and they're very, very old school, okay. And they, my grandma was like, oh, you need to save your period blood. And she wanted me to put my pad on my face, just slap it on there. And I was like, why, why exactly am I putting my pad, my dirty pad on my face? She's like, oh, it's going to be good for your pimples. Like, it'll get rid of your pimples. I was like, listen, Graham, I will live with my pimples. Nobody in school likes me right now. I have no one to impress. I'm good. I'm going to go ahead and just stick with my Neutrogena, which is also very terrible. So anyway, let's move on. Sorry if I don't, I hope I didn't offend anyone. It's just, I have a very not good relationship with blood and there is just no way I would ever use it for my plants. So the next one is use Super Thrive as fertilizer. I actually have used Super Thrive before. I think the last time I used it was maybe in 2019. My understanding of Super Thrive is that it is something that helps with rehabbing plants or um, for transplanting, like to reduce shock. Um, those are big claims. Anything that's like, oh, this is going to guarantee that, you know, your transplants don't fail or whatever. I, I really think that's a very bold statement. I also think that it's recommended that Super Thrive be used in conjunction with 
another fertilizer, but I have also gone down the rabbit hole reading endless forums of people who swear by Super Thrive and say they only use it um, solely as a fertilizer. They don't use it in conjunction with anything. They've been using it for years and they love it. And hey, if that works for you, that works for you. But I didn't really notice any like wow difference when I used Super Thrive. I feel like my plants have actually benefited more from being fertilized in diluted amounts and then since using uh, mycorrhizal inoculants. I feel like that has been something that has changed this hobby a lot for me. And I used to really, really get sucked into these like, I'm not saying gimmicky. I don't think Super Thrive is a gimmick. Like a lot of like respected growers and arid collectors use Super Thrive. I feel like when a fertilizer is being sort of touted as this like bright shiny thing like oh it's just amazing results like I don't know I, I nowadays I am more skeptical for sure um, especially when you look at like the ingredients in it like sometimes it's not even that different than like a fertilizer you can get from the store but in terms of my personal experience with Super Thrive it was not something that I felt like I needed to continue using for me it's a no for using Super Thrive as a fertilizer but I have used it for rehabs before like trying to get things to root I'll just add like a little drop of it I don't know if that's really helped at all or if it was all mental but I did used to do it and it worked it worked really well or I didn't have any like negative effects to it look how freaking cute this cupria is so round this is actually how big my cupria was my mother plant was when I first grew it out it was just a little tiny thing Oh, I'm so itchy. So moving right along, the next one is water your plants with Epsom salt. Epsom salt is essentially magnesium and sulfate. And um, just kind of looking at it from like a general point of view, yeah, like plants would not not enjoy that, right? I'm always sort of like pushing Calmeg on this channel because I feel like it's changed a lot of things for me. I'm so itchy. Why am I itchy? Plants need a certain amount of macro and micronutrients to sustain itself, to grow healthily, to keep their nice like green leaves or whatever color they're supposed to be. And for me as a hobbyist, I'm going to leave that to the professionals who make fertilizers to know like what is good for my plants. I don't feel confident in myself to like look at a plant and feel like, oh, I'm going to just give it some magnesium and sulfate, you know, and get the right amount or whatever. So I trust that my fertilizers that I'm using are doing what it says it's supposed to be doing. I am doing it based on the instructions that they've given me. And I just feel like that job should be left to the professionals. Because otherwise, like, let's say that I do use Epsom salt to water. You're basically just like infusing it with this magnesium and sulfate, not really even knowing if your plant needs that. And you don't even know what the ratio is, like how much is actually being watered in there. Like, well, that's way too much science for me, like honestly. For me, I can handle the fertilizer, I can handle the mycorrhizal inoculants and watering. And that's really all I want to worry about. To me, doing all those like DIY things or like hacks to get your plants to like uptake these nutrients without having to use fertilizer, I compare that to like cooking or like baking from scratch. I cannot cook or bake to save my life. So if you were to like throw a bunch of ingredients at me and say like bake a cake, there would be no cake. I mean, there could be a cake, but it probably wouldn't be very good. So for me, I like to use the pre-made stuff that comes in the box because they say that if I follow these instructions, I will have a cake and I can follow instructions. And I know that whatever is in this box and whatever portions they tell me to use is going to be right for the cake. And that's the only way that I can <laughs> put it is that I'm not a scientist, I don't know anything about chemistry or whatever, so I'm not going to look at this plant and be like, you need Epsom salts because you need sulfate and magnesium. You know, I just, it, that to me, that's just way over my head and I just feel like that's like a sure way to 
maybe kill my plants. So that's gonna be a no for me. So what I'm gonna do now, now that all of these are dried off, I'm actually going to take this to my bathroom and just spray it with Asmax because I want to ward off um, evil spirits. I'm going to be using this, this Dr. Doom Go Green in conjunction, in conjunction with Asmax. So this one says that it's for aphids, spotted mites, white fly, and thrips. And then this one is for spider mites, but I also heard that it has worked for people for mealybugs. So I'm gonna be using both of these as a spray. I'm gonna spray this one first. I'm gonna let it dry and then I'm gonna finish it with this. Um, I have done this combination before on my anthuriums and then also some of my plants on my shelves um, or my living room shelf didn't have any bad reaction except for two emergent leaves on my Campos Portoanum and my Micans, they kind of had these like pink spots, but those were just on like new leaves, but everything else was fine. So I'm gonna risk it for the biscuit and we're gonna do the same thing because it's been a really good combination for me. Um, and then I do need to get these potted before all these juicy roots dry out. So sorry, another ad break for you. I'm gonna do this off camera because it's just spraying and then we'll come back and get them potted. So everything is in the shower and I'm gonna let them just dry off. But I do have this little guy that I can pot up and I thought I saw a scale on it but it looks like it's just a little like um, callus from being sort of split open. At least I hope that's what it is. I really need to get a microscope for my, my plants. I just... Part of me doesn't want to scrutinize them that much, but another part of me is actually quite fascinated to see what I'd see. So I don't know, but regardless, um, we're going to get this potted. I think I'm going to put it in this little guy. I haven't really had anything potted in here for a while, and I just think it would look so cute. Don't these look like little green onions? Oh, I'm obsessed with it. I don't know where I'm going to put this one yet. I'm thinking maybe on a windowsill or just like on my dining table but it is an agave so I'm not quite sure how well it'll do just being on my on my table. My only other agave gemiflora that I have is sitting on my balcony that is being blasted by a crazy amount of light and it gets super hot and it is loving life. It's living la vida loca right now. I'm just gonna shove these <laughs> spindly roots that I feel are dead, but I don't think they are in here. And hopefully um, new soil and mycorrhizae will give me some nice juicy new roots, but who knows? Can you even see anything? Um, okay, let's just move right along. Honestly, um, I was gonna cover a little bit more in this video, but uh, if you watched my last one, you know that I'm, I'm going through a lot right now. So um, my filming capacity is a lot shorter than it used to be, and I don't even know if I'll be able to do um, a week of this month, but we'll have to see as it gets closer. So there's three more points in fertilizers that I'm gonna cover. So this next point says, use composted coffee grounds, banana peels, and eggshells in your substrate. I think I might have covered this slightly in my last video in part one of this and I'm gonna have to agree with this. Um, I think that when you just add like stuff like banana peels and and ground eggshells it takes a long time for it to like actually break down so that your plants can use it um, use the nutrients that you're trying to give it but in that composting process like your substrate can get really nasty so in a nutshell to not kind of go over what I said last time your fertilizers are already in a form that your plant can readily take up um, it doesn't need to be converted or broken down or anything it's already in the form that the plant needs it in but when you add things like banana peels or ground um, eggshells, 
it's not in a form that's ready to be taken up. You're basically putting it in there as just like a straight protein. I don't know if I'm using the right word, but it's it's not actually giving your plant the nutrients that you think it's giving it because it's just gonna sit there. You're better off throwing these things into your compost so that you can add it to your soil eventually. But adding these things as it is, is probably just going to make your soil nasty. And I think I touched on this when I talked about using um, starch, like like rice water for your plants because you know your plants need starches. But um, same thing, it's not in the form that your plant needs to use it right away. So if you want my opinion, uneducated opinion, I agree with this. I do think that your leftover waste is better off used in the compost if you do use um you know your compost for your soil i don't i do compost but i don't actually like keep the compost i compost <laughs> like we're supposed to in our building but um i'm not actually like collecting the compost materials and putting it into my plants i would really really love to have that loamy thing you know that loamy thing where it like turns your waste into soil in like 24 hours or something Oh, I would love that. I would love it so much. It's so expensive. But anyway, this thing is sticking out way more than I really want it to. But we're going to see if it works. If it was just a little bit deeper, that would be great. But like you see how the little green onion things, like the white part is sticking out. I don't know. We'll see how long it can live in here. But if I notice that it starts to decline, then I'll take it out. But this is so cute like just sitting on a table. I might even be able to just put this on my coffee table. Obsessed. Okay. Um, second to last one. Whew, guys, I'm struggling. My breathing is so bad this week because of like high anxiety. Oh my God, the next one. Use pee as fertilizer. No, 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 no. I can't remember what my grandma said to use pee for last time. I think I got like a cut. Oh, I'm not even, we're not even going, we're not going to roast my grandma right now. But um, I don't know what the benefits are of using pee as fertilizer. The only thing I know that pee is good for is if you get stung by jellyfish. So <laughs> I'm just going to quickly just say no to this. Um, I feel like that would be very nasty and... Um, would make your substrates not smell very good. So if you like using UP as fertilizer, hey, you know, who am I to stop you? And then the last one is you don't need to fertilize your plants. You would think this one is black and white, okay? You would think, but I know people who don't fertilize, one of them being my grandma. She Went years and years having these big rubber trees, big ficus benjaminas growing up. Um, and the only thing she would do is, I think, put her coffee water in it. Not like with the milk, but like what was left over in the whatever thing, what is it? In the pot. She would just throw the black coffee in there and call it a day. And those things were old. She's got some that are like older than me, so... Um, and then also Nick, not to call Nick out, but Nick, but for like the longest time, he was only using CalMag, or not CalMag, he was only using Marfil. And let me show you guys what's in Marfil. So if you guys don't know what Marfil is, it's this uh, soil enhancer and it's um, marine phytoplankton based. It says that it has... 0.042% of calcium, 0.136% magnesium, 0.19% nitrogen, 0.00096% phosphorus, 0.0314% potassium, 0.00053% boron, and 0.00042% iron. That's not much. <laughs> um, but he was only using these for his plants for the longest time, and he has the most gigantic, massive, humongous plants ever that are in like pots this big. Guys, every, the way that Nick grows goes against all law and, and um, what is it? What's that saying? It goes against all, it goes against the laws of 
physics. I don't know what I'm trying to say. But it goes against everything you're taught in this hobby. And you know, he makes it work. He grows plants way larger and faster than I do. And I'm here every freaking day babying my plants, buying these freaking products that cost an arm and a leg. And he just, yeah, he just grows plants way better than I do. And for a while, until I told him to start using CalMag um, and other kinds of fertilizer, he was just using Marfil. So, I don't know. My opinion is plants do need fertilizer. Um, my plants have definitely benefited from fertilizer and have grown really, really beautiful leaves with fertilizer. But I can't also sit here and say that your plants are going to die if you don't fertilize it because my grandma's sure didn't die. So... I don't know. I'm going to say, for me, um, I'm going to say disagree, but again, that's not Bible and it's just whatever works for you. <sighs> so that actually gets through all of the points I wanted to cover today. I think I'm going to save the rest for part three, but we still do have to repot the plants. So I have washed my perlite and let me go grab the children from the shower and we will just get this done. Since this transition is um, very temporary, I'm just, again, to remind you, I'm doing perlite before I officially transfer into Lechuza Pond. Um, I'm gonna keep it in perlite until it's showing me that it's like fully acclimatized, I see new roots, and it looks generally healthy. Um, then I'll move it, but it's gonna probably be in perlite for a good while. So with that said, um, I, I wanted to mention that because they will all be going in very temporary vessels. Not the prettiest, but they will work. I, this It reminds me, I actually saw, I can't remember, I think it was <laughs> Plant Me Ashley. She posted this thing on her story showing like this mean comment she got from someone and it was like, like something along the lines of like, I can't believe you, like, you people or whatever are using these, like, gross, nasty cups for these beautiful plants. Like, like, what's wrong with you? Like, give it a proper pot. The weird, that's, like, the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Like, you're telling people to not, for one, be resourceful and to recycle, but you're, like, judging someone based on the fact they're planting in a cup. It's in my house, like... What does that have to do with you? Why do I always have missing things? So yeah, I find that to be a very, very strange thing to bully someone over. This perlite is weird. Why is it like black? Look at... Hmm. Anyway, I'm gonna put the cupria in here. And I'm hoping this guy doesn't drop all of its leaves. And I'm also going to stick his little friend in the same pot because I'm eventually going to pot them all together. But I just want to make sure that these roots don't dry out. They've been out of substrate for a while now. Probably could use a vessel that's a little bit larger, but I don't really have one right now. Is it weird that I love the smell of perlite? I don't know what it reminds me of. I know I shouldn't be smelling it. I think it kind of reminds me of the smell of like, walking into like, is it a Home Depot or like a tire store? I don't know what I'm thinking of. This plant is so pretty, oh my gosh. And now I need one for my Aslanii. This one's a little smaller, so let's do this one. Yeah. I have a feeling that this Aslanii is going to throw a tantrum from what I put it through today, but I'm just keeping my fingers crossed because I find that when um, some allocations drop all of its leaves and go back down to basically just a rhizome, they don't ever come back. <laughs> like my Watsoniana, it dropped all of its leaves like shortly after I got it from the nursery and it's just been a stump for so long. It hasn't done anything. It hasn't even declined a little bit but also hasn't grown. No new roots. 
but also no root loss. It's the weirdest thing. You are done. Whew, okay, let's get this scalp room out of the way. I don't know if it's gonna fit in here. We might need a venti. So you've got this guy. And I don't know if I'm gonna plant, I think I'm gonna plant this little nubbin separately just because it's so small. Or I'll just put it with my other scalp room corms. Um, the question of where I'm gonna put these in the meantime is a big who the hell knows because I've just had this on my floor with like a big plastic wrapped over it so whatever's on there doesn't escape. But I don't think I can do that for very long because it's not getting light. I hope this thing perks up. They're like little taquitos. They're so like curled up. I feel like my, my makeup and my face is melting off. I just really, really <laughs> miss the days where I was headless. I would literally just turn the camera on and you guys like, you would never know that I was just disheveled from the neck upward. But now I actually have to try. It's so exhausting. I'm like dying to put these in my alocasia cabinet already, which is my red stuff. You missed it in my last video. I switched the two so my Hoyas are in here now. It made me kind of sad to see all my sad Hoyas in my red stuff and especially because i've treated all my hoyas with this sulfur dust that are all just like looks like they got snowed on and it was just like not fun to look at while i was in the living room so i switched them but i just ugh, i wish i could put these in my cabinet already so they can live with their sisters and brothers but i also am not trying to give my allocations that are currently um, pest free at the moment by some miracle. Not even a single spider mite, which is like mind blowing. So I don't want to undo the work that I've done. So I will be patient, but truly, I don't know where any of this stuff is going. I have too many plans. I need to downsize, but I just don't know who. A part of me is thinking I need to, I need to sort out this sort of garden that I have because everything is growing out of control which is kind of what I wanted, but now that I have to upkeep it, I'm like, well, why did I want to do this again? Um, so we might get rid of some of the Soderoids and um, reclaim that EXO, but I do plan on doing another video soon because you guys, if you saw how big my Soderini is now, I'm not gonna toot my own horn, but I told you it could get big. I just knew it. Also, I really hope this is a Dean McDowell because I am so terrible at growing pastazanums. And I would just be so happy if this was a Dean. And if I could confirm they were a Dean, you better bet your ass I'm gonna go to the store and buy like 50 of them because they're like $2 or something. So just, just to reiterate one more time in case there's any confusion, the reason that I'm the reason that I am choosing to do perlite before I switch over to pawn is because I find that my transfers from pawn into pawn my transitions from perlite into pawn are almost a hundred percent successful, um, whereas transitions from soil to pawn is a little bit more uh, dicey and I don't really want to deal with a million rehab plants at once. Um, so I'm just hoping that if I can if I can get some nice perlite roots to form on this, that the move into its permanent substrate, which is pond, will just be a lot smoother. I was honestly dreading doing that, but I'm so glad they are finally clean and I can be a little bit less worried about, especially those adult thrips flying around this plant room because I have worked too, ow. <laughs> I've worked too hard to get my collection to the point where it is now. This mole is not looking good, you guys. Or whatever this is, it looks bigger. I keep telling my doctor that I want it removed and he's like, no, you're fine. I want it off, so gross. But anyway, um, I don't remember what I was saying, but I do need to water these things. So here is 
the mycorrhizal inoculant that I freaking swear by. I think this month I'm going to try and do a video just showing you the plants that I inoculated back in, when was it, August, September. They are doing so well, like unbelievably well. Like I truly was not expecting this kind of result so fast, but I'm very, very excited about it. It's definitely one of the better mycorrhizal inoculants that I've used. So, um, yeah, this is like my go-to right now. Plus, great white, but I don't know why I like this one a little bit more. I think it's because I like the smell of it and it doesn't smell like mushrooms, but great white is also very good. So, anyway, this one says to use, add a fourth to half a teaspoon per gallon of feed water. Um, so, I'm just going to add about a fourth teaspoon. That's probably not enough. And this is supposed to also help with transplants. So hopefully it can work its magic. It smells so good. Like I want to eat it. It reminds me of, um, did you guys ever eat those like Lucas salts when you were younger or maybe now? Um, I don't get to have it much now because I don't even know of like a Mexican like grocery store here, but um, I grew up in California, so it was everywhere and I just love Mexican candy and I love the Lucas salt and like the the tamarind stuff oh, so good I think that's why I like it it sort of smells similar to what like a Lucas candy would smell like like the lemon one mm, I really I'm not gonna eat it but I want to I'm not gonna be adding too too much water in here but I definitely just want the her light to be wet and I want to get some of that good bacteria in here and I definitely know for the alocasias I've got to get it somewhere warm because these things will turn into taquitos by tomorrow if it's not given enough um, warmth and hyd uh, hydration is that the word I'm looking for like, I recently repotted my alocasia bisma on camera. I forgot which video it was. Maybe a week of. But, um, yeah, it turned into a freaking taquito the next day. And I had to take it out of pond and put it into water. And then it perked right up. But they can be really, really finicky. Look at this one already. It's already, like, so freaking dramatic. I mean, it's good that I didn't spend a ton of money on these plants. Like, they were, like, a couple bucks each. But still no excuse to just let plants die what else oh this one my green onions my little chives ah. <gasps> no. okay guys I think I am done here I am pretty much tapped out um, my I only have so much energy during the daytime now. I have felt this freaking hair on me. Here it is. <clears throat> yeah, I only have so much energy during the day now, so uh, I really have to like force myself to film, but I wanted to get these done. Um, didn't want to leave you guys hanging this week. I apologize for not being able to get through all of the points that I wanted to get through today, but I also have to keep in mind that the longer I film, the longer it's going to take me to edit and I'm um, just trying to keep a good balance right now. So I will continue this in part three. Part three will definitely be a lot longer and maybe a little more thorough like part one was. Um, if you guys have any sort of these tips that I have not covered in part one or part two yet, feel free to leave it in the comments or you can DM it to me if you don't want it to be public. And hopefully I can include it in part three sometime in November if not December but more than likely in November if these plants make it if they survive this transition I'll definitely give you guys an update in some future videos but for now they're probably just going to go into a bin and I'm going to ignore them for a while and just kind of keep an eye on the roots and make sure everyone looks okay um, if not then I'm going to have more alocasia stumps to add to my growing collection of alocasia stumps but otherwise thank you guys for watching another video 
Um, if you liked it, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up because it helps Pudge and I a lot on YouTube. I appreciate you for being here. Um, I might skip Wednesday's upload. I'm not 100% sure yet. And if I do, then I will see you next Saturday. But otherwise, thank you guys again for watching and I will see you in the next one. Oh my freaking god!